Welcome to Connect with Skip Heitzig as we look at the giants we face and how Jesus is provided as the ultimate giant slayer. Here are the points Skip will teach about in this message. Jesus was spiritually equipped for the battle. He was fully acquainted with scripture and Jesus was very direct in discussing the failure of mechanical religion to bring mankind into a real relationship with God. Now, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12 as we join Skip Heitzig as he points us to Jesus, the ultimate giant slayer. Bring this series to a close, Hunting Giants. Let me remind you that on December 17th, 1903, something happened that changed human history. When two brothers in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, discovered they could take their little machine that they built and actually fly. You know about it, Wilbur and Orville Wright. And uh, they didn't fly very long. The, the first flight was only 12 seconds. And then they did it again, and uh, that was a 15 second flight. They did it again, it was for 59 seconds, just under one minute, that's 1903. And they flew 120 feet. Well, they were so stoked, they were so excited, they wired, they telegraphed their sister, Catherine, back in Dayton, Ohio with the simple message, we have flown 120 feet. And that little telegram ended with this, we'll be home by Christmas. <laughs> We've flown 120 feet, we'll be home by Christmas. Well, she was so excited at the news that they have flown that she ran down to the newspaper with the telegraph and showed the words to the editor of the paper, and he read what they wrote. Have flown 120 feet, we'll be home by Christmas. And all he could say is, oh, how nice, the boys will be home for Christmas. <laughs> what a statement. He has just overlooked the news of the century that people have flown. Now, that little illustration illustrates what is happening right now. Most people are overlooking the news of the centuries. They're driving up and down Osuna and I-25 and all around town. Most of them aren't in church, most aren't interested in spiritual things, and they have overlooked the news that God stepped into human history in the form of a human being, faced death, and conquered it by resurrection. It's the news of the, of the centuries. It is overlooked. Jesus Christ is without doubt the most influential personality who has ever lived. Somebody estimated that Socrates taught for 40 years, Plato for 50 years, Aristotle for another 40 years, so a combined total influential teaching of 130 years, those three philosophers. Jesus' ministry was only three and a half years 
yet by far his influence is greater than all those guys. This shows up in Encyclopedia Britannica. That encyclopedia used 20,000 words to describe the life of Jesus Christ. 20,000 words. That's more words than they use for Caesar, Aristotle, Alexander the Great, Buddha, Cicero, Confucius, and Muhammad put together. Jesus never wrote a book personally, but books have been written about him that fill libraries. He never composed a song, but some of the greatest composers like Handel and Bach Mendelssohn, Beethoven have all used him as their subject matter. Jesus, as far as we know, never painted a painting, but some of the great artists like Michelangelo and Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci and Rembrandt have all composed on their canvases various scenes from the life of Christ. And did you know that Jesus redefined what a hero is? You see, in ancient history, heroes were typically killers. Somebody who vanquished other people with armies, those were ancient heroes. Caesars were heroes. Pharaohs were heroes. But now, centuries later, thousands of years later, society esteems saviors as heroes. The fireman who rushes into a building to save a child, the nun who works in a ghetto, the doctor who gives up his or her opulent lifestyle to serve the needs of the poor. Those we call heroes. It is Jesus Christ who explains that shift. So that if your idea of a hero is somebody who is humble, somebody who serves, and somebody who is self-sacrificing, that has been shaped by Jesus, who said, greater love has no one than this, than to give up his life for his friends. Even Napoleon said this, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I myself have founded great empires, but Jesus alone founded his empire upon love, and to this very day millions would die for him. And then he wrote, for Jesus Christ was more than a man. Now, here we are in Hebrews chapter 12. It's the final installment in this series. Let me just sort of tell you about uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and where we're at. The author of this book in the previous chapter, chapter 11, gives several examples of courageous faith. These are heroes of the faith. They have run the race of faith before us. Now in chapter 12, he hands the baton to you and to me, to us, and he says, now it's your turn. Now you're on the racetrack in the arena, and it is your turn to run the race of faith. Others have gone before you. He writes about them in chapter 11. Now it's your turn. And in doing so, he also points to another final example, the ultimate example, the giant slayer himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, who faced the enemy of shame and suffering and death and won. So what I want to do is go through this little section with you, Hebrews 12, just three verses, and actually we're only going to look at one verse, and I'm really glad it's familiar scripture so we can delve into it. I want to show you four aspects of this giant slayer's sacrifice. Let's begin in verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So I want to give you four aspects of his suffering. First, he furnished an example. See, what the author is doing is giving examples, but then saying, but now we're looking unto Jesus. And then in verse 3, consider him. Consider him. Look to him. As I mentioned, chapter 11 is a litany of heroes of the faith. They have run that race before us. They are courageous. Their names are Abel and Enoch and Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Samson, Gideon, Barak, Jephthah, David, and finally he says Samuel and all the prophets. So that's a whole list of good examples to follow. That's what we've done in this series. We've not selected all of them, but a few of them and others people like Nehemiah and John the Baptist and Gideon and Esther and several others that exhibited courageous faith. But now we come to the ultimate example of both courage and faith because Jesus faced a hostile crowd. You know, one of the things we note about the life of Christ is that while he was growing in his popularity, he was also growing in people's animosity toward him. I mean, Jesus faced a cancel culture before that was even a thing. They wanted to cancel him permanently. They wanted to cancel his life and destroy him. And so the author, we don't know who the author of this book is. Some say Paul, some say a number of others. I say, I don't know. But it's written. It's inspired scripture. And in verse 1 of chapter 12, the author places us on the racetrack. Now, I've always noticed that Paul and others loved to use sporting analogies for the Christian life. Um, I don't know if Paul loved Monday night chariot races or, or what it was, but, but he uses Olympic analogies from the games to talk about our life, whether it's boxing, I fought the good fight, or running, I've run the race. But here he chooses, or the author chooses, the idea of running. And again, Paul does this a lot. 1 Corinthians 9, he says, don't you know that all who run in a race, they all run, but only one gets the prize. So run in such a way that you might win the prize. So here we are, we're on the racetrack, that's the setting here. But notice it says in verse 1, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now let me just stop you right there because I've heard, I've heard so many sermons on this text through the years. and The typical interpretation goes something like this. We're in a stadium, and in the grandstands are all of the saints who have died and gone to heaven, and they're in heaven looking down on us on the earth, and they're cheering us on, and they're rooting us forward in our race of life. If that is how you have interpreted this, I would like to banish that completely from your mind. That is not at all what the author is speaking about. In fact, did you know the Bible nowhere says that when you get to heaven, you're, you're looking down and watching people on the earth, although you hear it all the time at funerals. I know he's, he's in heaven, but he's looking down. No, he's not. That's not heaven. I don't want to go there and look down on anything going on here. Uh, there's a, I, I've gone through enough. I don't want more of it when I'm up there. And you'd be glad to know the Bible says nothing about us communicating with people or acknowledging what is going on on the earth. You're in the rapture of heaven. You're in the glories of God. You won't be looking down, telling others, come on, you can do it. So what does he mean when he says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses? Easy answer. Everybody he just mentioned in chapter 11. In other words, they've run the race before us, and they are witnesses, not of us on the earth, 
They are witnesses to the value of a life of faith. It, it, there's a payoff to it. It's good to live this way. They are the great cloud of witnesses. They show the value of the life of faith. So we're surrounded by this nephele, this cloud, this mass of witnesses who, who have given us the examples already. Then he says this, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now that's a picture of a runner stepping out onto the racetrack and stripping down to bare essentials for the race. So if, if you're out there on the racetrack and you got your warm-up suit on, you take that off when you run the race. If you have weights on your ankles, which sometimes people train with, you, you get those off before you run the race. You strip down to bare essentials. You strip aside every weight and sin which encumbers you. There's an old saying, if we would travel far, we must travel light. And nobody knows this better than an athlete. Athletes train to get weight off, to get as close to 0% body fat as possible. They become a lean, mean running machine. And uh, they have to be very, very careful about what they eat and how they exercise because they want to stay in, in running shape. I read a story about an Olympic runner who came to the United States to compete. Uh, he had been called the world's fastest human. Uh, he came to the United States to compete. He ran in the preliminaries and was immediately disqualified. You know what the problem was? He gained too much weight. He was at one time the world's fastest human, but he didn't exercise as much over time. He ate a little bit too much, and he was not in prime shape. So the thought then is get rid of what slows you down in your pursuit in this Christian life, this race toward Christ-likeness, whether it's a habit or debt or uh, a pursuit or an association. Get rid of it. And as you're running, you got to look at something. you got to have your eyes fixed somewhere. And he tells you that in the next little statement. Looking unto Jesus, verse 2, the author and finisher of our faith. That's where we look. Now the word author, archegos, the Greek word, could mean originator. It could mean leader. Some translations say he's the founder or the champion or the pioneer of our faith. I think a, a better way to look at this is he is simply the chief example. He is the ultimate example. It's like, look, I've given you a whole bunch of examples in chapter 11. Now let me give you the archegos, the chief example, the author of our faith. So as you run, don't get distracted by life, don't get entangled by sin, but fix your eyes on Jesus and run. Fix your eyes on Jesus, just like the song, song we just sang. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. You know that's how we get saved. In a word, you get saved by looking to Jesus. You don't look to yourself, you look to him. You trust him. It's just he does it for you. Um, do you remember that crazy story in the Old Testament when Moses was with the children of Israel and they were complaining, and so a bunch of snakes came through the camp of Israel and killed a bunch of people? Remember that story? And so Moses is like, God, these people are dying. I need a vaccine. So uh, <laughs> had to throw that in. <laughs> so God said, well, I'll tell you what will work. Make a snake made out of brass and put it on a pole and put the pole up in the air and tell people to look at it. And if they look at it, they'll, that's your vaccine. They'll be cured. And I'm sh sure Moses is going, you got to be kidding, right? Like, okay. But it worked. And Jesus said this, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's how we're saved. We look to Jesus, and he saves us. But that's not only how we're saved. That's how we run. That's how we run. We run by looking in the right direction, looking ahead at Jesus, who has run before us. 
Um, if you want to lose a race, not that you ever would, look down at your feet while you run. You'll stumble pretty quickly. Or look at other runners on the racetrack. Or look at people in the grandstands who are looking at you. If you're looking at any of those things, you'll probably get hurt. I learned this in early days of mountain biking. I always had to look just ahead of the front tire at where that trail was going. If I tried to look at scenery, I would end up in the scenery. <laughs> but some people look at their feet while they run. Some Christians are preoccupied with themselves. Others look at, at the people in the grandstands. They're concerned what others think about them. Or they compare their running to other people. Well, I'm faster than he is, or, well, she's faster than I am, or she has a, a lot cuter outfit on. Her running outfit's better than mine. Listen, the best way to run the race of life is to end every day with a simple question, did I please God today? Makes it simple. Not what do others think or how, how, am I, how are my feet when I run, but did I please God today? Looking unto Jesus. So he is the best example. We look to him to see how to live. We do that quite literally when we read the four gospels. We read the life of Christ. We see how Jesus made choices. We see how Jesus suffered. We see how Jesus faced temptation. We see what Jesus thought about death and how he faced his own death. If you want to know any of those answers, you study his life. He's our example, our, our, the author and finisher of our faith. So he furnished an example. That's the first aspect. Second aspect I want you to notice is that he faced the intolerable. Notice what it says, that he endured the cross. He endured the cross. Now there's a theme running through this book and especially this chapter, and it's a theme of endurance. I'll tell you how I know how. Uh, verse 1 says, let us run with, what does it say? Okay, th you can talk in church. <laughs> look, look at verse 1. Let us run with endurance. endurance. And then verse 2, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, second time. Look at verse 3, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners. And then if you were even to skip down to verse 7, which we're not going to cover, he says, if you endure chastening. So it's pretty clear that one of the things that he wants his audience to do is to endure. Let me tell you what the word means. The word endure is often, the same word is often translated um, in our Bibles, endurance, patience, or perseverance. They kind of all mean the same thing, endurance, patience, perseverance. The word in the original Greek language is hupa mone. Comes from two words, hupa, under, and mone from meno, to abide. It means to abide under, or literally, to bear up under. To bear up under the pressure of something. That's patience. That's endurance. So it means to preserve under difficult circumstances with a steady determination to go on. A steady determination to go on. Endurance is like a postage stamp. It sticks to one thing until it gets there. You've been watching Skip Heitzig with part one of the message, The Ultimate Giant Slayer. Join us next time for the conclusion of this important and practical teaching from our Hunting Giant series. Let us remind you that a real relationship with God means knowing Him in a personal way. Knowing God doesn't mean trying to be a good person or even going to church. It means accepting the free gift of forgiveness and eternal life made possible by Jesus' death and resurrection. If you would like to know more about this crucial step, we have a special video by Skip Heitzig that will explain this relationship and give you the next steps to take. Watch this video under the Know God tab online at connectwithskip.com. Now, let's watch this about our current resource offer.
Joy in the midst of hardship is a hallmark of the Christian life, but is it really possible? Here's Lenya Heitzig. Sometimes what starts out as a happy trail turns into a really daunting road, and we have to figure out how to navigate. A lot of times, God's purpose in allowing trials is to give us opportunities to grow to the point where we genuinely experience joy in the midst of trials. Learn how to face trials with courage, wisdom, and yes, joy, with Lenya's booklet, Happy Trials. And when you give $20 or more today to help keep this Bible teaching ministry on the air, we'll send you a special bundle of three booklets by Lenya, Happy Trials, Don't Tempt Me, and Speak No Evil. In Don't Tempt Me, I hand you the keys to unlock the thoughts, circumstances, and fears that can cause you to give in to temptation. And in Speak No Evil, I encourage you to avoid setting fires with your words and instead use them to bring showers of blessing. Get your bundle of three booklets when you give $20 or more by calling 800-922-1888 or give online securely at connectwithskip.com slash offer. To receive this package of special resources, call now 1-800-922-1888 or check in at connectwithskip.com. That's 1-800-922-1888 or connectwithskip.com. And join us next time for more Bible teaching from Skip Heisig. Thanks for joining us on Connect with Skip Heitzig. We're connecting you to God's never-changing truth in ever-changing times. This program is brought to you by Connection Communications.